All right, so we're gonna we're gonna start with that. We're gonna start with just a quick video. I'm not gonna run this all the way through, but just uh, to show you what we're we're kind of up to here. If I can get it, really contact us. Fashion is particularly exciting right now. In additive, uh, a lot of vendors like to say you get complexity for free. Uh, that's not as true on the design side. One of the common problems for any design engineer in manufacturing industry is to strike this balance between uh, the design freedom and the computational complexity. Our invention offers a lot of nice advantages right now. There's so many things that designers and engineers cannot create, or it's just too difficult to create with the, the existing tools. So we're giving them new representations, new methods, new, new functionality uh, that will allow them to create these, these new amazing products. One of such problems is the design representation and analysis of uh, complex parts. And uh, for example, parts that may have lattices in their structure. Think of Eiffel Tower. Uh, that is uh, one example of a lattice structure at a macro scale. So the Eiffel Tower consists of arrangement of beams that are connected to each other uh, in a periodic fashion. In fact, uh, uh, one beam may have several other smaller beams and in fact that is the case with the Eiffel Tower as well. Now imagine uh, increasing the number of beams from a few thousands to a few trillions and uh, connecting them in many, many more complex ways. Uh, so in terms of lattice microstructures for 3D printed part, that is the level of complexity that we are dealing with. So previously these, these designs would take, uh, you could take hours even to load them into, the, into your design software. And with our representation, we can do that in seconds. We're bringing that down to kilobytes in size, so it's a ridiculously uh, huge savings in representation size. We could have gone ahead and designed more complex looking lattices, but... Alright, so that, that's enough of the video here. You didn't come to see videos, so let me put a presentation up here. All right, so I'm, I'm Mark Burha. Uh, I work for, for Siemens Technology, which is basically the research group of Siemens. Uh, so I'm really, you know, I'm really excited to, for this group here uh, to, to be here. Uh, like Dylan was saying, it's, uh, uh, it, it, there's so many people that I've, I've been wanting to meet that I finally got to meet. There's so many people I've met the last, uh, the last uh, day. Uh, it's just wonderful, it's really cool. Um, usually I would ask, you know, since we're in New York City, who went out and, and went to uh, see you know, Times Square or whatever, but th this group's a little bit different. So who, who went home last night and did an interface to ChatGPT for your software? <laughs> so I, I, I had that idea. I, th I, thought it was, I, I thought it was really smart uh, talking about that a, a month ago, and, then, and I learned yesterday half of you all have integrations for your products already. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit humbled now. I'll have a lot more to, to, to work on here. I'll have to raise my game a little bit. Um, so, so if you don't know Siemens, uh, if you came in on a train today or, or leaving on a train today, it was probably pulled by a Siemens engine. Uh, if you work in the medical field or you've been in the hospital or visit your doctor, you probably saw Siemens on a lot of the equipment there. Uh, if you uh, design products, uh, or do simulation, maybe use NX or SimCenter or some of our, our, uh, our software there. Those are all different business units within Siemens. I don't work for any of those business units. I, I work for Siemens Technology, which is basically the, the research group for Siemens. So this is other group here. Uh, for the United States, we're based in Princeton, New Jersey, so it's a real easy trip there. And, and what we tend to do is, we don't, have, we don't sell anything. Uh, the real reason I'm here is, is really to partner with many of you. Uh, we partner a lot with universities, with other, other folks. Uh, we work on problems either for our business units, we work on problems for the government. You'll, you'll see some work we did with DARPA here coming up, and, and many of you actually participate in some of this, this DARPA work as well. 
Uh, and, and a lot of it, you know, or we'll look on some things that are maybe important across all the business units. So you'll see us talk a lot about the industrial metaverse now. Not my talk today, but, but with me, uh, again, these are, these are some areas that we work on. I'm more on the, I guess, on the green side here, on the, on the left side, but next generation algorithms, which we'll talk about, digital twin technologies, uh, all these things with generative design, uh, a lot of machine learning, so a lot of our folks are working on, uh, you know, ChatGPT, uh, or a lot of the machine learning type things. Uh, we do a lot with materials, so we, Siemens owns a lot of additive man manufacturing machines as well uh, already, so we, we do a lot with developing our own materials, uh, machine technologies, we, we use all of them. And, and we love software and hardware, so we have a lot of, uh, you know, in clusters, we do a lot with uh, GPUs and, and other things there. So if you're looking for, if you're a researcher, um, want to partner with us, that's great. If you're a PhD student, please come talk to us. We have lots of openings there. So this is, this is the, uh, you, know, you know, reinventing the wheel. So this is a uh, concept that we had uh, a few years ago. Um, basically in talking to, to NASA on uh, the spring tire that they're, they're building. And this really came about from uh, a few years ago, you know, 2006, 2016. Um, DARP, you know, those of you that are you know, in your 30s and 40s remember, uh, the, the biggest debate in CAD back then was whether you want a history tree or not in your CAD system. Uh, it, it was kind of settled down, it was kind of not really interesting, and then additive manufacturing comes around and gets a little more serious, and all of a sudden you could create all these wonderful things that you couldn't design. Uh, and so that, that really um, made things interesting. So, so DARPA, which is you know, very forward thinking, uh, said, hey, maybe we need to fund industry to advance the state of the art in, in design software. How can you now design these, these super complex parts uh, that, that you can't design today? And of course, lattices, uh, metamaterials, all these things kind of come into, into play there. Uh, all of a sudden, you're not filling your parts with a header or a homogeneous material. It's, it could be anything, right? It could be different materials. It could be all these different shapes and so on. So we partnered, in this case, we partnered with Palo Alto Research Corporation, uh, Georgia Tech University, uh, Michigan State University, and, and we came up with some new ideas uh, on how to, you know, it was really three things. I'm only going to talk about one today. Uh, it was how, to, how do you represent these really ultra-complex products? Uh, how do you uh, do simulation now? So you got this awesome, complex thing. How can you do a simulation there? You can't just put a tet mesh on it. Uh, and how can you then manufacture these, these ultra-complex parts? So I have parts now that, it, you know, if I slice them, well, first I can't slice them because they're too big or too complicated, uh, and then I can't send it to the machine because the machine doesn't have memory for, the, uh, for all the G-code that goes there. So there's still, you know, it's gotten a lot better since then. Uh, a lot of these DARPA folks were PhD students. They've gone out into industry. They work at a lot of the companies. Some of you may have even worked on some of this. So it's, it's really uh, kind of interesting. Um, so I, I'm, I'm focused on geometric geometry representation. So the additive manufacturing people are my best friends right now because they've created so many really interesting problems. So the, this blue side here, don't look too closely. I just threw some words up here on things that were, you know, that I, I remember. But this blue side here was pretty well understood for a while. Um, the new things here that, you know, th that's going on are, are really a lot of fun. So the, these lattices that we're doing, 3MF is changing like crazy. We're talking about metamaterials now. We're doing things with fields and applying fields. We've got implicits, so new, new mathematics. Um, voxels uh, are suddenly, you know, really in vogue right now, much more than just Minecraft. Um, topology optimization, so, you know, structural is there, CFD is, is, is crazy. Uh, I put G-code down here. I, I want to fix G-code. Uh, G-code is my, you know, after, after we kill STL, uh, I'm going to kill G-code. Um, but it's, it's, you know, still, still growing strong. And I put code off here in a second, and this, this is what we'll talk about. Um, it, it's a fun area right now because we, we still have a lot of things that we can't, that, that we, there's a lot of things you could probably print right now if you sit there with the G-code and, and write a really fun area to be working on. Uh, this, 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 this is actually an old slide, but it's, it's, it's 
you know, this, this was our justification for a lot of the work we did. And now it's, it's more of a state of the industry uh, type slide. Uh, you know, shoes, people are doing shoes all over the place, you know, consumer products, light weighting is, is a big deal. Uh, energy absorption for, for uh, sports equipment is big. Uh, woven materials, I think we, we can still do some more things there, um, but you're starting to see again where they're, we're, we're running, uh, um, you know, filaments or fibers through, through 3D prints as well, medical devices and so on. Uh, so a, really a lot of interesting things um, going on uh, that, that where this, is, this type of research is important. So who, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I put this post out here, so don't, don't answer the question. But for the rest of you, how, here's, here's a really simple box, and it's got wire, film lines going through, uh, cylindrical wires going left and right, up and down, forward and backwards. How much space would that take to represent in whatever format you like? So any, any guesses? Well, it's, it's huge. If you, if you go back to your, your, your dad's uh, CAD system, which was only six years ago, uh, y if you try to do this with B-reps, solid models, uh, it's huge. It's, it's, it's over a gigabyte, and actually I, I got kind of tired of waiting for it. I, I knew I had a smaller model uh, that was over a gigabyte, so I know it's over a gigabyte. Um, but it, it's a lot of space, and it's, it's, it's really, this is why, you know, you see a lot of people looking up new ways to do things. Uh, STL, uh, 237, so, uh, you know, it's a faceted model, a little bit smaller. And, and then these dials on the side, those kind of represent accuracy. So your B-Rep is pretty accurate, but the STL, right, to get it that small, you have to you lose a few things. Uh, hybrid CAD, and, and hybrid CAD, I don't want to call it hybrid CAD anymore because it's really kind of today's CAD. And most CAD systems are not looking at B-reps as their only representation. Most of them are looking at, uh, you know, facet models, they look at graphs, they look at a lot of other things. And uh, in many places they're becoming equal peers. So you have to work with multiple representation forms as equal peers. You have to be able to take, you know, facet model with the B-rep model and do a Boolean and subtract things and have faces that are uh, you know, meshes and other faces that are, that are precise geometry and maybe other faces that are, that are uh, some implicit definition. Um, so it's really, you see CAD moving that, that direction a lot. Um, 3MF is, is awesome. So Duan, thank you very much. Uh, this, this is using the lattice extension there. So what this does in 3MF is lets me represent lattices as a graph rather than as a faceted model. And it brings it down a huge amount. And then we have, get text messages. We have uh, our representation here, uh, which is representing this by a program, which is tiny, tiny, tiny. And uh, you know, it doesn't apply to everything, but, but I'll show you some really interesting things here. And, and, and really, one of the things I want to do is get you all thinking about this too, because I know there's some really smart people in this room. Apparently, a lot smarter than me because I hadn't thought I hadn't integrated ChatGPT in my software yet. But uh, you know. Think, think about some of this here. Um, if, anyone can, if anyone can pronounce this guy's name, uh, that would be great. Call Mogorov Complexity. I love the, I love the, I love what it is. Uh, I, I've never mastered saying it yet. Uh, this is kind of the concept here uh, to, to a certain extent. If you have, if you have this, uh, I guess I don't have the laser point. We'll get ahead. If you have a, a if you have a string of of characters here, uh, so here A B A B A B A B and another one just kind of random characters, they're both the same length. Um, the the idea is, what's the smallest program you could write to reproduce that that string of characters, at least in this case. And the, the easiest one is you simply write a function that returns that string, right? Um, but if there's some pattern some information there that, that, that you can use, you can really take advantage of it by writing a function that, in this case, it's AB, it's AB. And so if you're doing random things in your added machine, uh, it, this may not work so well, but most of you are not. Most of you have some, some, some uh, lattices especially are very much patterning. Uh, it's patterning and maybe morphing, uh, which is it's almost the same thing uh, as what we're doing here. We, we pattern and we morph. So really, you know, let's, let's apply this not so much to compressing data, but let's talk about how we can 
represent geometry. So this is you know, one of our examples, and this, this is actually, I, know, I probably took this about four or five years ago now. Uh, this is a, a 3D print that we did. Uh, it's a, a woven, woven lattice. And the entire representation here is, is on the screen. So if you take a picture of that and you ran it our software, it would reproduce this um, um, piece of, of, of geometry. Um, compare that to an STL file. If I had to print the STL file, it would be, be a big box of paper here. Uh, it, it's not really good. If I could, did a graph uh, of, of this, um, it would still be pretty big. Uh, so this is, this is really, um, really pretty cool. So um, I'm, I, I may be new with ChatGPT, but I have um, Dolly down pretty good. Um, one of the problems I had with Dolly said, so, okay, show me the, the difference between DNA and elephants. And, and this is kind of something I got. So the, this, this program representation is a lot like DNA, right? Uh, the, the DNA is the program for how to build an elephant. Uh, the problem is, you know, lots of you know, it, there, there's lots of ways, lots of people written code to generate geometry, right? There's, there's even the CAD systems out there that all they do is you, you, you write a script and it and outputs geometry at the end. That's not the solution. It's, it's it, it, yeah, you get a small representation, but at the end of the day, after you run the program, you still got this giant representation of things. So you still got an elephant uh, that you, you need to, to somehow work with. And so that, that's not, by itself, is not the solution. Um, we need to, to think about how we can, um, you know, not, you know, instantiate an elephant every time uh, we want to do something with it. So, this is where the where it got a little more interesting. We, we spent a lot more time on the mathematics. There's a lot of papers out there, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the high points here. Um, but uh, you know, go look at the papers if you if you're really interested. If you if you do a, a CAD system. Uh, it doesn't matter what CAD system it is, what design system it is. Uh, you, do it, you end up doing queries, and maybe it's not called queries, but it's essentially queries. You say, okay, I got a point, that XYZ location. Is it inside, outside, or on the surface of my geometry? And if it's outside, what's the distance from it, uh, from the geometry? Uh, other questions, you know, I, I, 3D printing. Uh, you know, I want a 2D cross section of my geometry because I'm gonna, I'm gonna print layers, right? So give me the, give me the 2D cross section of my geometry. Or, you know, what's the weight of my part? How much, what's, what's the mass for NASA? What's the mass instead of the weight? Um, traditional methods, you know, again, I, we talked about it. It could take hours. It, there's one part here that we have, uh, which is a, a, one of the DARPA challenges we had, and it's kind of an optimized lattice. You can see kind of the fields running through it a little bit. Um, so I, I created that, and then, then I wrote some code to bring it in our CAD system to, to load it, and it takes hours. It's, it's just so huge and big, uh, and you can easily imagine gigabytes and terabytes of, of memory for really big parts, especially as these lattices get really small or if you get really big structures. Um, the, the graphics get slow, so I know a lot of you are, are struggling with that too. What, you know, I got so much data, and uh, you need to find ways to, to, to bring the graphics down to something that's manageable so the user's not sitting there with the, the screen jerking once a second uh, as you try to rotate. Um, but after you get everything loaded, it's, it's pretty fast, if you, assuming you can load everything. What we did here was really a, an idea of kind of a lazy and local method. So we, we have seconds to load a file. So this big, this big thing is a few seconds. Um, you know, it's kilobytes of memory needed, which some of that you, you saw earlier. Uh, it's, it's fast graphics, you know, regardless of the size. And, and there's a little penalty, though. We have slightly slower queries. And, and the reason that is is because we don't stand, do it in a, in a kind of a lazy and, and local way. So lazy means I need some geometry I want to see, so we'll instantiate the geometry then. But computers are getting so fast, it, 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 it works pretty well. Um, we also do it locally. So if you want to you know, look at a, a slice of your part, we just need to instantiate enough of the geometry around that slice to do the slice. We don't need the whole darn part loaded into memory uh, to do that. Now, eventually we will. Um, but um, it, it just works really well. Uh, and, and then the other part, you know, some things, you, you maybe need the whole model, right? You wanted to figure out what the mass is uh, of the part. Uh, you, you can't do that, you know, just with, with local things. 
but it turns out you can't because you can now distribute it across all these computers and each, each computer, each CPU or each GPU is calculated a different piece of the model. So we, we have some scalability now that we can uh, get the mass relatively quickly by, by parallelizing a lot of these things. And uh, parallelizing is, has been a challenge. A lot of you know in geometry, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to parallelize your FEA uh, solvers or your renderers or other things like that. But parallelizing around geometry is, is a, a harder, harder thing to do. Um, but this is, this is at least one way that we're, we've been able to do it. So again, it's, it's really geometry represented code, and this is, this is one of our examples here. Uh, just, uh, I, I, I backed up, so this, this, the nice thing here is this, this part is pretty complicated, but it's kind of at the limit of, say, B-reps, if you want to do something like that. Uh, you can pick some other uh, uh, methods to, that go a little bit farther. We, we got to, you saw the video yesterday, Powers of 10. I, I was watching it, hoping it would get to 10 to the 15th, but it got to like 10 to the 5th. Uh, we got to 10 to the 15th number of elements in there, which is an astronomical number of, of, of so that would be 10 to the 15 beams, let's say 10 beams per unit cell, so we get 10 to the 14th unit cells. So if anyone could beat that, um, you know, I'll, 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 I would like to follow you and learn how you did it because it's, it's just amazing uh, in, in, in being able to do something like that. So it's nice too because the additive guys kept, you know, hey, you, you can't hold our geometry. Well, well now I got this. It's hey, can you do, it? it's like, well, you can't do the resolution I need because I have a lot more detail now on the, on the design side. So I'm ahead of them, at least on this, this area here. I can kid my, my additive friends a little bit more. So it's real simple. This, this is a simple example. Uh, I, I put this here just to kind of give you a flavor for the idea. Uh, it's kind of trivial uh, uh, how it works because I think just with, this is just a kind of a translation model. So you're just patterning uh, with exact patterns. That's a really easy one. Um, but you, we can do rotation, scaling, all these other things too uh, that make it a little more interesting. But if you, you we have this idea of a kernel. Uh, it's kind of like a unit cell, but not quite a unit cell. It's a little bit different, but what you have is, is some nodes in your, your kernel, and you define connections. And so you say, oh, this, this node in, in uh, N1 connects to N1 in the next unit cell, if you will. We'll, we'll stick to that term. Uh, uh, in the I direction. And this one connects to N1 in the J direction. This one connects to N1 in the K direction. So that's what you see here. So you have a node here at this, this spot here, and it connects to here, here, and here. Um, and then you can, you can start to uh, add other transformations. So here it is with, um, you know, we're, we're, sh we're showing a range in the in, in directions in, the, in this little model here. So here we have two, two directions, or two in that direction, three. And if you add more and more and more, you kind of see it, it scales out. So that's kind of the, the basics of it. And that, that's pretty easy to understand, right? Lots of um, CAD systems do patterning and other things like that. But it gives us a nice, easy representation. Um, we can do more things that are a little more interesting. So you, you saw at the beginning, we talked about the Eiffel Tower in the video. So doing lattices of lattices is, is really kind of cool, or lattices of lattices of lattices. Uh, where, the, the, where the lattice beams are actually made up of more lattices. Uh, you know, that, that's really kind of pushing the boundaries right now. But again, we have concise representation. Uh, you know, you go to any additive manufacturing conference right now and you see you, you, this table will have a bunch of lattices to show that they can print lattices, and this table will have a bunch of gyroids to show they can print gyroids. So I, here are gyroids made of lattices. Uh, which so uh, you know we we can do some some really interesting things here uh, you know some of these things uh, we could probably do gyroids made of lattices made of gyroids uh, if we really wanted to uh, in, in a lot of this you know I'm talking about lattices it's 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 the the piece we kind of push through and really beam lattices um, but it, this ha this works with other things too. Uh, we did some, some rockets that we were designing with this, uh, with representing code, and the ultimate output was, was voxels, um, but, the, but the rocket itself, the definition was a piece of code that did everything. Um, and so, like I said, it's not just lattices, uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it's any kind of repeating geometry, maybe it's not even connected. Uh, so here's some, some Lego pieces that's really a bunch of inter, interconnected parts. This one's fun for my, my grandkids. Um, how am I doing on time? Does that mean I have plenty of time? I get zero. Oh, I didn't see you. you I didn't see you. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up. This is the last slide. I'm sorry. Okay, um, good and bad. So let's last thought. Uh, you know, program represented with, with what you want, uh, encapsulating equations, it, it, it's great. Um, implicits, you can encapsulate implicits in, in a program really easily. You can encapsulate, you know, voxels uh, in there. Uh, you can get derivatives uh, if you want to do some more advanced things. You can encapsulate G-code. Uh, this, this is a good one. So we, we, if you have an Ultimaker 3 or above, there's actually a really nice Linux machine inside that you don't know that's in there. So we hacked the Linux machine and now, now our Ultimaker 3 takes a piece of Python code and, that, and it runs it. And, and then from that Python code, it lazily and locally generates a G code. So it's manufacturing as well. So it, it cuts down, uh, you're not giving this huge pile of G code to something, you can give it an algorithm and it calculates. Uh, it's smart geometry. Uh, it, you know, it, it adapts to the machine you're on if you need to. So let's say you want to output voxels. And on this machine, the voxel resolution's here, but on this machine, the voxel resolution's a little bit higher. You, you don't have to give it different voxel files. You can give it the same program, and it will, will return the voxels for the resolution you need. So all the power of code, which is awesome. Um, there's some bad things, but I'm out of time, so no. No, I'll, I'll mention the, the bad, bad things too. Endless loops, right? You don't want to put a machine, you don't want to put your 3MF file in a machine and have it lock up the machine, right? Um, so you, you have to deal with things, all the problems with code. Uh, bad actors, th this is the one that this is, I hate, I hate these folks, because I, I now that you need to have security in there. Um, so you don't want to put in a, a file in your 3D printer and suddenly your 3D printer spying on everything you do. Uh, that wouldn't be so good. Lots of solutions, though. These are things, it, you know, if you're on Discord, uh, do on next, next year, I want people's Discord IDs on their, their badge, too. Um, we're a lot talking about other things. So there's sandboxing, and there's WebAssembly, and other, other things that are really, really good. Uh, code reps, I, 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 I meant to give a shout out, too, for the, the, the end top folks there that, uh, that were talking about this. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of this came from some common origins with the DARPA project, so the code reps maybe is, is an interesting one as well. Um, and, fi and finally, I'll get off the stage. Uh, so contact, uh, if you want to connect with me, like I said, we're always interested in, in working with you all uh, in, in supporting the community uh, in, in doing different things. Again, I'm, in, I'm on the technology side, so I'm not really, uh, um, you know, I, c I can be friends with everybody, right? So Siemens is, is hard sometimes because one company will be a, a competitor to one business unit, but another business unit's a partner, another business unit's a customer. Um, you know, in my case, so I get to be, like I said, friends with everybody. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>